Angel fans, it's Jordan Harmon. I wish I was out uh, in the live stream actually with you. Uh, I'm recording this remotely because I am out of town. Um, but the, uh, man, this is such a beautiful project. Live Not By Lies has so much potential to change the heart and hearts and minds of an upcoming generation by hearing the real stories of people who have experienced these things. And, um, and so, I wanted you to realize and understand that we're so honored to be partnered with their team and we're so grateful for stories that can change the world and that amplify light throughout the world. So anyway, wanted to send you this message and, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the live stream. Joining us tonight, I am RJ Moeller. I'm one of the producers of this project, uh, Live Not By Lies, that we're going to be talking about this evening. We've got a little bit of an agenda. Uh, I'm going to introduce you here in a second to my colleague, Isaiah. Uh, we're going to go through a little bit of why we're here, why we're uh, pursuing this project. We're going to bring in a very special guest, uh, the author of the book, Live Not By Lies, that all this is based on, Rod Dreher. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what we're up to, what we hope to be up to. We'll take some questions from you guys. Um, and But for now, before I share a little bit more about myself, Isaiah Smallman, our director. Hello, friend. What's up, everybody? Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's great to be here. Thanks, RJ. Um, yeah, my name is Isaiah Smallman. I'll tell you a quick intro about myself. I'm a director and a producer and a writer and um, a couple other things, I guess terrible musician Man about town. Is one of them man about town for sure small town only though uh well tell people I where, where, up, where are you broadcasting from give us right now where are you well at? yeah oh good point yeah i'm in tennessee chattanooga tennessee right now uh we i grew up in baltimore maryland and had an interesting upbringing there uh, my parents were community development workers i'm going way back rj i hope that's okay and no, uh, we, we 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 lived there for about 15 years and a little longer and uh yeah learned a lot i think about relating to people and all that kind of stuff and my dad was always in music and then at some point he made a career move into making videos and got to spend a lot of time working with him as a young guy um, stealing the gear on the weekend, making short films, you know, starting at 14, 15. And, and really at that point I got to be around it enough and I, and I learned a lot, but I also realized, I think this is what I want to do with my life and, um, saw just the impact that great visual storytelling can have on people and how much fun it can be and how challenging it can be in great ways and have really been pursuing that ever since. Um, so yeah, I kind of, have taken an interesting path to get to where I am now. I didn't go to film school. I didn't do any of the traditional things. I just uh, went to a small school in down here near uh, Chattanooga called Covenant College, a small Christian school. Kind of carved out a little niche for myself making films. And um, soon after that, started a creative agency called Fancy Rhino. Um, and we did work for all sorts of different people, including um yeah some big we we, we got kind of lucky and and started going after these big clients like nike and disney and landed a couple of them and it was always supposed to be this sort of middle step between what i was doing in college and somehow making movies and it turned up turned out to be this whole thing in itself and so that company grew and learned a lot about business which was something i never kind of expected to need to know or want to know and realized oh i like that too and so when I decided to finally get into the filmmaking side of things, I actually started more as a producer. And so, um, yeah, I, I started raising money for projects and started putting deals together. And um, we had a nice little run and went to Sundance a couple times, went to South by a couple times. This is a, a some behind the scenes footage actually of the first film I directed a feature. Um, I pulled a couple clips of us on set. And um, yeah, so I was able to write and direct my first feature um it was about a concert venue and this guy who inherits this concert venue it's a beloved old venue um from his family and he's struggling to try to keep it alive anyway so that's a that was a fictional thing and then the very next thing i did actually was a i think we have a poster actually for sandtown which is not out yet but um it's a documentary that i made about my experiences growing up in baltimore actually and so i saw a lot of the conversations that people were having about 
<clears throat> race and politics and the intersection of all of those things. And I was listening to a lot of people talk about stuff and I was like, I don't think a lot of these people know what they're talking about because I don't even think I understand the com complexity that's happening here. And, and that's not to say that there aren't experts, of course, but um, I became determined to sort of get to the bottom of how I feel about some of these really scary, complex things, um, like how I feel about people who are different than me, which, you know, is a difficult thing to talk about. And so I actually decided to go back to Baltimore and spent um, a lot of time over the course of a year reconnecting with friends who I'd grown up with. And, you know, we had this really tight knit community. And then over time, we all kind of drifted apart. And so it ended up becoming this memoir really about, um, yeah, going home, the grief and pain that kind of comes from growing up, which is a good thing, obviously, but also very difficult. And so I'm currently finishing that up. It's, it's kind of in the latest stages of post-production. And through that process, I really fell in love with documentary filmmaking as well. I think I still love scripted entertainment. I think it's an amazing way to tell stories, but that was the first feature documentary I'd made. I'd made documentaries a trillion times for companies like, yeah, Nike, Dix, whoever, who who want to tell short form stories, but I'd never done it as art. You know, it had always been marketing. And all of a sudden I was like, whoa, this is a really powerful thing. It's also scary. And we can kind of get into this uh, later when we kind of get into what we're going to be making with Live Not By Lies. But you can't write the script because it's real. You know, <laughs> so you're stuck yeah. uh, going out and finding what you find. So anyway, I'll quit yakking, but that's kind of a little background. No, no, no. This is great, man. And, and I want to come back to you, you here in a second when we get into uh what what we're doing here what's the story we want to tell and what it means to us what it means to you and i, I have a couple of questions to prompt you with uh there but but yes isaiah and i are old friends we've been dying to work for you project came along uh which i'll give you a very quick little background on me and how we got here but um uh i live in uh, the nashville area franklin tennessee but like Isaiah, we both have spent time in Los Angeles. We both moved our families here to the free state of Tennessee within recent years. We both have recently had new additions to our family as well. Uh, my wife and I just had our fourth daughter, Clementine and Isaiah. Uh, you guys, how it's a couple months or how long has it been since your newest arrival? Yeah, he just uh, just hit five months, our second. So five months, wow. Yeah, well, you can time mark flies. the time, and I'll. I'll share an anecdote here in a second of how we got into all of this, this whole project, but it is crazy. You know, as filmmakers, I'm a film producer. I was in LA for many years. I grew up in the Chicago area. Dad's a pastor, um, oldest of six kids, uh, and my wife and I, and again, our four daughters, we now live in Tennessee, but uh, I, I started in journalism and academic research and kept coming across these great stories in my 20s and trying to figure out how do we somebody should make a doc on this. Somebody should write a script about these things. And eventually after saying that for like seven years to people in my life, everyone said, well, why don't, why don't you do that? And so I, I'm a very literal person and uh, shortly thereafter moved to Los Angeles and, and uh, have been able to work on a number of exciting projects through the years. Uh, we had a big documentary a few years ago called No Safe Spaces with uh, Dennis Prager and Adam Carolla. Uh, that was a lot of fun. That was about free speech and, the reason I'm even bringing it up beyond just my quick bio is through the making of that film, I was able to meet and be exposed to a lot of different interesting thinkers. Like, for example, I got to meet Jordan Peterson before he was Jordan Peterson. Like, I didn't even know who the guy was and he was in our film, but he was so interesting. I'm like, man, that guy's going places. And then, you know, six months later, he became who he is. Uh, but along the way, also getting to, to become a fan of and familiar with uh, Rod Dreher's work. The Benedict Option, which we can talk more about uh, with Rod and uh, in a few minutes when we bring him in. But uh, for me, reading this book in early 2021, which it's just crazy to think how long uh, film projects take to make, to develop, to 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 build a relationship with someone who's written a book or you know uh, has lived an interesting life that you want to build a story around. Um, and I think we actually have a picture of it. But Rod and I and my family. We all had breakfast together in March of 2021 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. There we go. Look at um, these lovely and folks. That's when I uh, uh, put Rod in a headlock and said, you're doing a film with us and this is going to be it. And we're going to build a team and we're going to make this happen. And so it is so uh, rewarding, fulfilling, exciting to now be here a couple years later with an amazing team 
uh, with again, Rod, who we'll, we'll welcome in, in a couple of minutes and, and share more from him. But it's like, Isaiah, you can, if you want to speak to this as well, just, I know a lot of people watching this probably are somewhat familiar if they're fans of Angel of how films get made, but you really have to care about something. You basically have to say, I'm going to take an idea or a book or an article or a script, and I'm willing to spend the next three to 10 years of my life getting this done. You have to have that mindset. Totally. Uh, you're, you have to be in it for the long haul. And so when we read Rod's book, Live Not By Lies, I've got my, my autographed copy that Rod gave me the morning of that photo that you saw. Um, obviously, the world we're living in um, and the things that we've all gone through in, the, in recent years, uh, Rod, who started the book before COVID, before all the, the other things that we've, we've gone through, um, uh, was, it was so prescient. And I remember reading it right after Christmas 2021 and just going, I, who is, I, I, I knew who Rod was, but I'm like, I got to meet him. I got to talk to him. We, we, something has to be done. And I assumed at the time there was probably a long line of producers who had already optioned it and were fighting over it. And I was thrilled uh, to find out that it, the rights were available. So we got the rights. We started to build this project out. We brought our friend Isaiah in. And I want to get into now pivoting out of our bios and background um, to say, uh, to, oh, one quick reminder. We are doing a Q&A at the end of this. So please start su submitting questions and let us know uh, what you think. But um, Isaiah, I think this is a good point here to pivot into you know, it's a big story. It's a weighty topic of totalitarianism, authoritarianism, people that have grown up and lived under these, you know, communist regimes, um, which will be a big focus of, of this uh, initial doc series that we, we hope to do. But, um, you know, for you and your journey and as much as you're comfortable sharing, what resonated? You know, you've shared some with us, but I, I think fans would, would like hearing why this book, why did this story mean something to you personally and things that you've gone through? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, first of all, I just want to say we've had a couple people uh, expressing interest already. Josh M, one hundred fifty bucks. Michelle R, five hundred. So thank you. Just a reminder, we need your support to make this. Um, you know, I'll try not to hammer that home too many times, but no, if you're please, liking please what do. Rod has done in the book, if you like what we're talking about, if you like your our approach, we've got Bobby M with one hundred and fifty. Way to go. Um, this is a this is an incredibly important project for right now. And what's interesting, RJ, you know, you asked this question about my journey to get here. Um, back when I knew RJ, before I was at a very different place in my sort of philosophical, political journey. And I think I thought, man, RJ is this super cool guy. We will totally find something to work on but it's probably not going to be something like this. Like I was thinking, yeah, like RJ's doing his kind of conservative projects over here. We'll find something that's nice and perfectly in the middle, or maybe even a little more left. Cause that's just where I was at the time. And I think it's interesting looking back on that because that wasn't that long ago. And I think the more I've just looked around at the world and the more I've frankly grown up and um, living in California for a while, will kind of open your eyes to some things as well. I realized, you know what, like there's great people, obviously on every end of this political spectrum, but I'm worried about what's happening um, in a lot of ways with, and we've got Logan. Thank you, Logan. Um, I'm worried about what's happening with the idea that people are trying to tell me how to live my life. And they're trying to tell me what I have to say all the time. And that actually came up a lot with the documentary I was making. I, I, I actually kind of try to get out of directing it because I was like, I don't think I'm allowed to make this movie. You know, like I'm, I, I, I felt scared of what I needed to say about my own story, which was crazy. And a lot of people ended up telling me that, that like, including some directors I approached about possibly directing it. They were like, you don't need another director. You're a director. You do this. And I was like, yeah, yeah. But like, I don't know, like I might get in trouble. And they're like, who cares? So that was really part of what opened me up to this. And then when RJ and David approached me, about this book, I'd read the Benedict Option, which is another of Rod's book that's just absolutely incredible. And a lot of people, um, you know, if you haven't read that, that's a great book to dig into as well. Um, it's very different than Live Not by Lies, but really terrific. And I and I thought, yeah, I don't know if I'm ready for this still. Um, all right, Eric R. Five thousand. Thank you, Eric. That's a big, big, big uh, express Attaboy. of interest. Thank you. Um, and I thought, you know what? Uh, yeah, I'm not ready for this. 
I'm, I'm not ready for the consequences. I'm like, I'm already going out on a limb making this other movie that I'm going to, people are going to be mad at me for. And, um, and I kind of in my head was like, yeah, I don't think so. But, they, but RJ and, uh, RJ was like, Hey, you know what? Um, read the book, really think about this. And I read the book and I was like, you know what? I don't care what everybody else thinks. I, uh, this is really good. And it has a lot of interesting, um, like RJ was saying, it felt like I was reading into the future just a little bit and, and also reading right now. And I felt like, wow, okay. Cr so maybe I'm not crazy to think that some of this is a little crazy and um, maybe there's really precedent for this. That's what began to really resonate with me is that none of this is new, you know, and I'm a big history yeah. fan as well. I know that's RJ's thing. None of this is new and it's not even ancient history. That's what's also crazy about it. It's very, very recent. And there are people living right now who can say firsthand how crazy things can get. Um, and so I think that was a lot of what inspired me is I didn't expect to be so immersed in the now of this whole story. And um, the fact that Rod was able to go to Europe and meet these people and they could give these firsthand accounts, um, that really inspired me. And then the idea that we could do that. And so really quickly, I'll just add kind of where we're, what, what we, the vision for this is, which is it yeah, kind of started as maybe we up. should make a feature. Yeah. Maybe we should make a feature. And, and I started digging into the book kind of in a deeper way and started talking to um, RJ and Rod. And I thought, you know what? I think there's a series here because there's too many stories. You know, I just come off of making a feature with a lot of really interesting stories that were constantly competing. And I think I was able to find a way to tell them all in a way that's really cohesive. And um, I, I, it was a cool challenge, but I was like, I don't want to have to cut every story down into a three minute arc. You know, like I want to spend some time with these really fascinating heroes and, and give them time to tell their stories and really dig into some of the issues in a bigger way. And so we really started getting excited about a multi-part series. And um, yeah, that that's kind of where we are right now. And I'll, I'll, I'll quit yakking for yeah. a minute because I think now might be a good time to hear from Rod. But um, yeah, it's been it's been a really, really great journey already. And I think it, even in the amount of time I've been involved with the project, which is less than the book, you know, has, it, it feels so much more relevant today than it did even six months ago. And so I, that's just super exciting. And by the way, Vlad, Dan, thank you guys as well. Love the support. Yeah, thank you guys. Ivan, so, awesome love, stuff. Yeah, but I've seen that over. support. No, no. It's so I, we want to get to Rod here in a second, but just to, to make sure as this is our first live stream and we're, we're settling into this and we're going to be doing another one next week. And there'll be more to come as we, as we um, uh, share more of this story and get to know fans and, and hear what, what they're excited about. But like, like he's, like Isaiah said, you can do a feature film and kind of have 90 to 120 minutes to tell a story like this, or you can chop it up and do it episodically. And that's what we've chosen to do. So this is a documentary series that we we're putting together. And the core subject matter is, of course, in this book, Live Not By Lies, The Rise of Soft Totalitarianism, uh, you know, the subtitle, A Manual for Christian Dissidents. So this is a story we want it to be. We hope people, uh, we hope Joe Rogan watches this movie and is inspired by it. We hope Bill Maher watches yeah. this movie. We hope they're in this movie. We hope we can talk with guys like that. But really, this is for people of faith and conscience. Um, uh, who are typically the, the first to be persecuted in societies where things like free speech are suppressed. Um, and so we're going to explore that. Rod, we're going to bring in here in a sec. He can tee up more and share why he wrote the book, um, why he chose uh, to work with with us on this and and what motivates him. And the I'm still wanting doing. to hear that part of it. Yeah, that's, that's the biggest mystery of all. But that's well, why we're here. We want to do a documentary series. Yeah. We want to tell these stories. We want to travel uh, to, to Eastern Europe, we want to go. I've always personally been fascinated with Russian history, with European history, mm -hmm. uh, and so much has gone on in the last hundred years there. But to Isaiah's point, and the last thing I'll say for now is, of course, we're all seeing uh, day by day what it looks like when governments start to, and, and, and peoples and, and entire societies start to tell each other lies about the most basic mm -hmm. truths of the universe, the most basic facts yeah. of biology. Uh, and and economics and history and all of these things. So that's why we're here. We care about these things. We want to do justice to the great work that Rod's done. And then I know he was motivated by the important stories that um, 
uh, remarkable and heroic people of faith have have shared with him and some that didn't live to tell the story, but others lived on. And so we want to make sure that we we capture this, uh, especially while some are still alive as, as people are getting older. So, yeah, with all that said, yeah. well, let's and get, really quick let's get to before the, before sorry, Rod, because, you know, Rod. Love you, Rod. Get in here soon, but he's not important as our wonderful supporters. Just kidding. We're all important. Terry M. from Tennessee, hometowner, and Mitchell, thank you. And yeah, the last thing I was going to say, RJ, is just uh, I the 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 idea that lies change who we are was something that I really hadn't thought of before. I think encountering this, it's like lies was this thing that you do that's maybe a sin. It's kind of bad, but the idea that it's this massive psychological shift in the way that you view the world and the way that the world you know operates that was fascinating i think that's another thing that again you can see in history and it's so important for right now because again we go along with these um these little things because we don't want to rock the boat and that's where all of this starts and there's such a clear historical case for that that we can trace michelle thank you so anyway to rod now i'll quit talking yes mr Dreer, can we have uh the man of the hour join us all the way from Budapest, which Budapest. I just learned is Hungary. half Buddha, half pest, and was was uh, reunited right. at some point. Uh, Rod, welcome. He's in Thank you for Let's joining be very us. clear about that. He is in Buddha. Yeah. He's a Buddha man. Yeah, Rod, I, thank I, you I'm, so I'm much. Here. What time is it? What time is it uh, where you are, and uh, why in the world are you doing this project with us? Uh, I'm. Uh, it's two twenty-one in the morning here in uh, in Budapest. I'm looking at the lights glinting off the Danube River over the top of my laptop. And um, I'm, I'm really, really thrilled to be doing this project, uh, in part because uh, young people who may not have found their way to the book, they'll find their way to the video. Just uh, last night, I was having dinner with some Hungarian friends, and they were talking about how even in this country, this post-communist country, so many young people don't really know the history of what their parents went through and their grandparents went through. And uh, these these young people, they may not pick up a book, but they'll surely tune in to watch something on the internet or, or however it comes to them. And so this is a way to help spread the word. And I have to say, listening to what you guys were saying earlier uh, sparked a few thoughts in my mind about what has happened since the book was published. If you go into the book, there's a quote by uh, Father Kirill Kaleda. He's a Russian Orthodox priest in Moscow. And he talked about in 2019, when I interviewed him, he talked about how the lies being spread on Russian state television about the people of Ukraine were the government was trying to prepare the Russian people to hate the Ukrainians. Father Kirill saw this happening and he called it out. And now we see the war is going on. And Russia is the only one of these countries that I wrote about in which Live Not By Lies has not been published. And uh, I think it's probably because of what Father Kirill said about Ukraine. Secondly, I'm excited to do this book or do this uh, film project with Angel Studios with its grassroots orientation, because that's how Live Not By Lies became so popular. It is by far my most popular book. It sold over 200,000 copies uh, globally. It's in like 10 or 11 languages, most of those in the United States. But get this, it has had very little mainstream media coverage. Uh, my book, uh, The Benedict Option, which is the, my best-selling book prior to this, had tons of media coverage. Live Not By Lies was ignored by the mainstream media. It is primarily it has primarily become a success through word of mouth. I hear from pastors, I hear from church people saying that oh, I bought five copies of your book for my the staff at my church or for my my my, uh, my Sunday school class. People who read it know that it's telling a very important story about our time, and it's a call to action. Finally, I, I was I wrote this book as a conservative, a political and religious conservative, and a Christian for fellow Christians. But don't you know, the people who have discovered this book are people who don't even share my faith or my politics. Barry Weiss, the, uh, the independent journalist, became a big supporter of the book, as did Brett Weinstein and his wife, Heather Hyde, who are both atheists. Uh, Peter Bogosian, also an atheist. They're anti-woke people, and they know that the lies might come for the Christians first, but it's going to come for anybody and everybody who 
refuses to kowtow. Uh, Barry Weiss told me, she goes, you know, Rod, I never imagined that I, uh, you know, as a center left uh, Jewish lesbian would ever be working with Rod Drio on anything. But I'm proud to be working with you on this because this is important. And I'm proud to have people like Barry uh, with whom I wouldn't agree on a lot of things. But we agree that this is an important message. I was told, and this is in the book, too, I was told by a, a woman in Prague, uh, Camilla Bendova. She was the she and her late husband, Václav, were the only Christians in the inner circle of the top rank of, of dissidents there, anti-communist dissidents. And I said to her, I said, you know, Camilla, you and your husband were very, very strict Catholics. And uh, Václav Havel and the other dissidents, they were pretty much hippies. Was that difficult for you to work with them? And she said, absolutely not, Rod, because when you were standing up against totalitarianism and those lies, the greatest uh, ally are people with courage because courage is the rarest thing you can find. So she said, we looked around to our fellow Christians and they all had their heads down. They did not want to speak up. They didn't want to get in trouble. They, did, they wanted to just keep their mouths shut and go along to get along. It was these hippies who had the courage to stand up and they knew that we, my husband and I as Catholics would stand with them. So uh, that really taught me something guys about you know, the kind of uh, resilience and the kind of allies we'll need to make to resist what's coming. I'll give you a little background on uh, where the book came from. I, I got the idea seven or eight years ago when I first began hearing for, back in the United States from uh, people who had come to America to escape Soviet communism, but who are now saying the things they saw happening in America today with the rise of wokeness, cancel culture and all that, reminded them of what they left behind. Now, I thought that sounded kind of weird to me, kind of alarmist. Come on, where are the gulags? Where are the bread lines? They couldn't really articulate what they were seeing, but they could feel it in their bones. Well, uh, the more I uh, started talking to them, the more, I, the more I thought about it, the more I realized I see what they're getting at. This is not hard totalitarianism like the Stalinism uh, and the post-Stalinism that they escaped from. This is a softer form of totalitarianism. It's more Aldous Huxley, Brave New World than George Orwell, 1984, but it's still totalitarianism and that's what they see. A totalitarian movement uh, is one in which there or a totalitarian society is one in which only one way of thinking is tolerated. Anyone who goes against it is punished, is marginalized and maybe even imprisoned or killed. We see happening in our own country now, and these, these people, these dissidents uh, awakened me to it. We see uh, people learning how to police themselves, to suppress any dissenting thought because they're afraid of being canceled. They're afraid of losing their business, losing their friends. It's happening around any number of issues. There's, we have to learn how to stand up now. So what I did with this book is I, I, the first half of the book is talking about the ways that the, the soft totalitarianism is taking hold in the U.S. and in Western Europe. The second half of the book is about my having gone to Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland and Russia, uh, talking to people who stayed behind, who didn't escape, but who stayed behind and who had to figure out a way to resist as faithful Christians the persecution that was thrown on them. And I got from them advice on what we should do today, we Christians and others living in the United States and in the free West, how should we prepare for what's to come? And uh, it, it's really incredible, the, the, the stories I got. It's all very practical. Um, one of the, the things that really impressed me, and I dedicated a book to this man, there was a priest named Father Tomislav Kolakovic. Uh, he's dead now, but he was uh, doing, he's Croatian, and he was doing anti-Nazi work in 1943 in his home city of Zagreb. He found out that the Gestapo was coming for him, so he escaped and moved to um, Slovakia and began teaching in a Catholic university there. He told his students, I have good news and bad news. The good news is the Germans are going to lose this war. The bad news is the Soviets are going to be ruling this country when it's over, and the first thing they're going to do is come after Christians. We have to be ready. So what Father Kolakovich did was bring together uh, groups of students to pray, but not only to pray together, but to talk about what practical things they could do to get ready to keep the life of the church going under persecution. Within two years, every town of any size in Slovakia 
had at least one of these groups, and these groups networked. Some of the Catholic bishops in that country said, Father, Father, you're scaring people. You're being an alarmist. It'll never happen here. But Kolakovich had studied communism, and he knew what was coming. Sure enough, when the Iron Curtain fell over that country, everything happened like he said. But the underground church was ready. I dedicated this book to the memory of Father Kolakovich because I believe that we in the West are now in a Kolakovich moment. It may not happen exactly the way it happened there, but it's coming. The people who, who are our early, uh, our early warning system, the, uh, who sounded the alarm, are those who lived through it before the earlier version. And now they're trying to tell us, this is what you all need to do to get ready. I love that. Man. Rod, thanks for sharing all that. And I think it's it's two things you said that that prompted kind of important thoughts on my end, which is one, um, the practical nature of the book. And I think also the practical nature of what we want to do with this show. It's it's not just this hypothetical out there our theory. And it's it's not even just, oh, you should be afraid. It's like, no, there are steps that we can all take right now to prepare ourselves for this. And that, that actually even played into that idea of, you know, what should this form be? And that was in the, in the sense of a series, it was like, let's make this the kind of thing that we can share with people and that other people can share with other people and that it's very practical in the way that it's structured. And so that was really informative for me from a creative standpoint about how do we capture that side? And, and, and also it's true what you were saying about um, the, kind of relationship between Christians and non-Christians and people from different philosophical standpoints. That's another thing that's exciting about this story is that we really have an opportunity to be totally true to the Christian side of this story without kind of gutting that of its, of its truth. And the fact that we believe that the church has a lot to offer in this situation, but also be very uniting. And the goal of this series is ultimately, at least for me as a creator um, of, of kind of the, the film version, I want to go super hard after these issues. And yet at the same time, I'm, I'm, totally committed to the idea that we might catch people with this series that like you said would never have imagined that they would work with you or would never have imagined that they would connect with this story we you know our goal is to tell this story in such a way that this isn't just for people who are already aware of this and who are already amped up about this and want to do something about it but might actually be able to tip some people over the edge and to educate them and say you know what I'm ready to do my life a little differently. I'm ready to talk a little differently about some of these issues or, or actually maybe, you know, get engaged. So that was something that popped in my head as well that I think is, is really important in terms of our approach. Well, you know, you're right about that. And this is not a call to be alarmist and just sort of sit there paralyzed to go hide under our beds. There are things we can do right now, like the, uh, the unready Christians of Slovakia were able to do because they listened to what Father Kolakovich was telling them and they took practical action. They couldn't stop the bad thing from happening, but they could un they could assure that the life of the church would continue. And uh, it was just incredible, the stories I heard. And one thing I, I like about the fact that we're gonna be able to do this film is that the viewers will be able to see the joy and the happiness and the peace in the faces of these elderly people. You know, as you were saying earlier, RJ, these people are dying. One of the, the main people I talked to, Maria Wittner, a Hungarian who was a hero of the 1956 uprising against the Soviets, she died last year, that we're starting to lose these people. But the ones I was able to talk to, and I really couldn't convey this properly in print, just the, the sense of light and peace coming off of their faces. Uh, these are people who, live through the worst the 20th century had to offer, almost the worst, um, and yet their faith brought them through it. And uh, it's it's a gift that they have for the rest of us. I tell a story in the book, this young man, Timo Kriška, a photographer and filmmaker in Bratislava, capital of Slovakia. Uh, Timo uh, uh, set out to do photographic portraits of people who had survived, uh, the Christians who had been through imprisoned for their faith. And he went to take their picture. A lot of them are still living in poverty, but he said that the gift they gave him was a sense of deep peace in his own life because he realized that he was being tyrannized by ambition and anxiety and things like that. But the simple faith of these country people who had paid a deep price early in their life for their faith in Jesus Christ set him free. And he's a man who didn't know communism at all. He was a toddler when communism ended. So there's that lesson too. Even if we never face persecution in, in our country, 
we are still persecuted by our own fear of living differently from the rest of the crowd. Totally. Yeah, I think that is, was something that really hit me with, with a lot of this is this isn't just about the s s slavery of, of all sorts. I mean, it's in our minds in a sense, like, yes, there's, there's the, the government forcing you to do things, but um, there's so much that we can do in our own lives. Like you're saying, not just to prepare for a, you know, a shift in sort of the way that our society functions, but um, the way that we think and being free, that's such an important thing. And I think these people have found that and, and it takes many forms and it doesn't have to just look like, you know, being a dissenter in a, in a totalitarian society. I think it can, again, for us, there are lots of ways right now that all of us can learn from these examples um, and, and live a more free life. Anyway, Arjun, go ahead. No, no, it, it's, this is such good stuff. And I want it. We have a few other segments and things we want to get to. Uh, we're gonna again. We're gonna be doing a Q and A. We've already got some questions lined up coming up. We do want to touch a little bit upon uh, some of our approach of how we want to tackle this project. And to do that, first and foremost, we need you guys to keep doing what you're doing on this live stream, which is going to uh, angel.com/live/live/live, and uh, let us know. The whole purpose of this testing the waters campaign that we're in the middle of is for fans to, to, to send that signal, put that flare up in the sky. We want to see this thing made. We want to partner with these folks. Uh, we want to support their yeah. efforts, which is so important. And uh, so Isaiah, I want to give it to you here in a second to, to talk a little bit about how we're going to be approaching that. But the last thing, Rod, for now, and then we'll come back and do Q&A with you as well, Solzhenitsyn. He, he's my entry point into this as a, in high school, reading the Gulag Archipelago, reading uh, great works by Dostoevsky and others. There he Look is. at that. Uh, the title of the book, can you give us a very quick, give us a very quick summary. And that, that portrait is amazing. But give us just a quick one minute, like who Solzhenitsyn was, what he means to you, why the title of the book, and then we'll get to some other things. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was the greatest of all the anti-communist dissidents of the 20th century. He wrote a, a great book called The Gulag Archipelago, exposing the cruelty of the Soviet uh, prison camp system where they threw dissenters. He won the Nobel Prize uh, for it. And um, he wrote, just before the Soviets threw him out of their country because he was such a troublemaker, he wrote a, a short letter to his followers in 1974 titled, Live Not By Lies. And what he told them was simple. He said, look, we can't go out and stand on Red Square and shout down with the government. That would be insane in this country. But here's what we can do. We, we don't have to be passive. We can choose not to live by the lies that they expect us to bow down to in order to be part of this society. He said, so when you are asked to sign a petition for something you know is a lie, don't do it. When you're st standing in a room where lies are spoken and you're not allowed to speak the truth, walk out. Little things like that can show your own resistance to the lies. And he said, if enough people do that, if they have enough integrity just to simply refuse to accept the lies and to nod their head and go along to get along, then the whole system could fall apart. But that's, that's how each individual, however powerless you think you are, you're not powerless. You can always say no to the lie if you're willing to suffer for suffer the price for standing for the truth. That's an important part of it. That's so beautiful. Well, I was just it's, telling. It's, sorry, go ahead. Isaac. I was just yeah. telling these guys earlier that 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 I was having a conversation earlier today with somebody who I, I doesn't identify with any of this outside. Like he he he's never heard of Rod. He doesn't know this book. He's not conservative particularly, and um. It was just fascinating because this exact topic came up. It, it was, it was, he, he said to me, you know, it's crazy. It's just this web of lies that everyone, you know, the government's telling it, there's people telling like, and, and you just have to, you just have to sort of go along with the little one and then it turns into a big one. And he was narrating that to me. And I was like, wow, okay, this is definitely becoming more sort of something that people are aware of. And, and it didn't used to be, I think it did used to sound fringy. And now I think more and more people are realizing, nope, this is the reality that we live in right now. Oh, yeah. I, I, let me just say real quick before we go, uh, uh, RJ, we've seen with the Twitter files, for example, the things we're learning now about what the government during the COVID crisis uh, told and worked with the 
with um, with the Facebook and Twitter. Don't let people say these things and how they manipulated it. It's just, it's insane. But this is the sort of thing that these dissidents saw coming. And it's so important for we Americans and Western Europeans to realize what's happening and that we can stand against it. Uh, I mean, you know, one more thing quickly on the suffering uh, aspect. This turns out to be the key to building resistance is to be willing to suffer faithfully as Christians. Uh, this is what I heard over and over and over again from these people, some of whom had been tortured in prison for the faith. And it made me think about the church in America, Catholic, Protestant, or whatever, Orthodox. We aren't ready for this. Our, our churches, our pastors, our priests, our lay leaders, we all talk about a gospel of comfort, a gospel of therapy. That ain't going to cut it. These people who live through persecution have, are saying as loud and as emphatically as they can, you have got to go back to the old faith and know what it means to suffer for Christ or you're not going to make it. This message we are going to bring front and center to this project. Love it. Okay, so we only have a few minutes left. And, and Rod, you hang out here. Uh, we're going to get to Q&A. And we want you to participate in that in a minute. But very briefly, and we'll save some of this more in depth for next week, Isaiah, but do you want to give folks maybe just a quick one, two, three minute uh, overview of how we want to approach this? Again, we need your support, angel.com slash lot live. We, 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 uh, we are hoping that there's enough interest and support as, as we are seeing the numbers go up, which is exciting. Uh, and we, we hope to get to make this documentary series, but Isaiah, just a quick overview for people of what we plan to do if we're lucky enough to, to make this project with them. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think, yeah, I want to also highlight thank you to all the people who have supported just while we've been here. This is great. Um, please continue to do that. We're, we're trying to, yeah, we want to build momentum and thankfully we've been able to. Um, Rod has uh, done a lot of work, obviously, over the years to build uh, quite a significant following and um, great relationships in the broader sort of media space, which is also exciting to me as a, as a filmmaker, because I think, wow, there's actually people paying attention to what we're doing. I mean, that's amazing. That's kind of the dream. We already have that. And yet at the same time, this is so important that we want right now, we want to start laying the groundwork to be able to make it uh, really get out there and to make it at a really high level of quality. Um, because that is part of what's going to break through some of the kind of cultural political boundaries that might um, under certain circumstances, sort of pigeonhole a project like this. We again, we want to make something that's really um, exciting for a lot of people. Again, including people who may or may not automatically kind of identify with some of this. But yeah, so thanks again to everybody. Um, the approach is is somewhat in development, and I think that's because we are looking to get going as quickly as we can, and yet at the same time this process is somewhat unpredictable right now what we know for sure is that there's an amazing opportunity to tell these stories while these people are still here and as uh both rj and rod have pointed out we don't know exactly when that's going to happen that's part of the 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 difficult thing about documentaries um you know we didn't know that there was going to be a war in ukraine uh we didn't know a lot of things and yet the sooner we can kind of get get the ball rolling on this, the better. Um, again, we're we're making a series, which is very exciting. Um, my hope, from a creative standpoint, is to really have multiple kind of through lines happening at the same time, and so that again, it's it's very useful. It's it's going to be cinematic, and it's going to be fun to watch, and it's going to be educational. But at the same time, I want to have layers because ultimately, that's the best part about storytelling is that you don't just have to explain something you know you do you you learn through uh the kind of the layers of the storytelling that are happening and so part of what we want to do is say yeah we're going to talk about some contemporary issues we're going to also just tell some amazing stories of these people thank you um yeah this is great uh footage that rod got um with timo actually who he mentioned um we want to go talk to these people and hear from them what they saw but also the, again, the beauty of stories that told well is that you you get so much more information out of them than just ideas or just sort of facts. You you get to understand people and something we were talking about earlier that's so important. And and Rod mentioned this as well. You just you have to see 
what's happening in these people's hearts. And, and in a way we can capture that. Um, and I think that was one of the things that really struck me about the book. And I want to figure out a way to capture this is let's talk about suffering. That's a really, really important thematic focus of this series. Again, not only because we're not ready to suffer under certain circumstances, you know, say if we had a, a regime like, you know, they had in the USSR, but not only that, but because right now we need to reorient what it means to suffer because that is where freedom, freedom, true freedom is on the other side of learning how to suffer and, and, and deal with pain. It's not from running away from it. That's something that I firmly believe. And I think that we can learn a lot from these people who I guarantee, Rod, you could probably confirm this, but not a single one of these people looks back and says, you know, I wish I would have caved, you know, I wish I would have just gone along with it all so that I could have my no. career and I could have, I, I bet there's not a single one. And yet that's kind of a paradox in a way because they did real, really suffer. And I think that's something that we really want to figure out how to capture um, in the way that we produce it. But again, just to recap the details, I mean, we want to go to Eastern Europe. We want to go soon. And we're really excited about getting in there and, and starting to tell these stories. And then as, as those start to be gathered, we're going to build the series around those and have really interesting ways of bringing in experts you know, for example, uh, as we mentioned, you know, Dr. Peterson and other people are big, have a, a real vested interest in these stories and this sort of overall message getting out and are supporters of this. And we want to bring those voices in too and build this really compelling kind of mosaic of stories and voices that can, again, build this case effectively in a very cinematic way. And so that's kind of the goal that we have. And, and, and we're just really excited to get going. But yeah, Rod, go ahead. Yeah, real quick, um, that the, the footage you were just showing that Timo shot, part of it showed me going down into a hidden room. You had to go into a secret passage to get to it. It was a hidden room where the underground church in Slovakia printed prayer books and hymnals and things like that for 10 years. They were, that, there it is right there. Uh, you, it, it was in a normal house now. That's a historian who of the underground church who took me there. This is a beautiful story of how the church works. That room was, it was the construction took place and there was an offset printer sent to them to the Catholics of Slovakia by the evangelicals at the, um, in, uh, in the Netherlands. And they snuck in two different groups. They, they smuggled in the offset printer so they could print gospels uh, piece by piece. Then they sent another team in. This is Brother Andrew's people from the Netherlands to uh to reassemble it these evangelicals did this that's in the room that's the offset printer on the right they still kept it there after communism fell the government never found it but these evangelicals helped the catholics and it, this was that was the first place i went was bratislava and i learned there for the first time a theme that kept coming out as i as i interviewed people the the unity of the church catholics protestants orthodox when they were in prison together, they helped each other, these believers, because they knew once they were in prison, they weren't in prison because they were Catholic or because they were Protestant or because they were Orthodox. They were in prison because they were followers of Jesus Christ. And that is a powerful, deep ecumenism, the kind of ecumenism that I can support because it's just, it doesn't get more raw than that. Um, one brother and sister in Christ to another. And that's one of the aspects I really want us to bring out in this project. No, this is this is fantastic stuff. So again, uh, we're going to get to some Q&A here in one minute. We're going to be back next Thursday night so we can unpack more of this and share more and interact with you guys. But we want to make six episodes of this series. And that happens if enough of you uh, are gracious enough to partner with us. So please uh, a few plugs here for, for social media. Another thing, um, angel.com slash live. We've been touting it. You can see it at the bottom of the screen. Go there, express your interest, tell your friends, share it with your uncles. Let people know if anyone you know loves this book or cares about these sorts of stories to go on and uh, express interest. Instagram. Yeah, and speaking of live. process, well, go ahead. So, yeah, I was going to say, speaking of process and how we're going to make it, I mean, I love... I love making stuff while I'm making stuff. So this is going to be a really fun process to keep you guys uh, in the loop with. The, the first movie I made, I actually started a podcast just to basically fill people in along the whole process of making it and kind of the ups and downs of the process. And um, we're really excited to work with Angel to 
provide some really interesting kind of behind the scenes content as we go and, and really starting soon because this process is already underway. And um, yeah, and, and you can follow that as RJ was going to say on, on Twitter, we're live not by lies series, Sam on Instagram. Um, you can follow on the website, you know, I'm sure we'll get an email list set up. So, but yeah, RJ, we're, take it away. No, no, this is all, this is all good. There's no set formula. You guys jump in each step of the way and all of this is important. Um, so yeah, Instagram live not by lies series. Uh, the Facebook page is live not by lies. Twitter, I'm never going to call it X. I don't care. You can put me in a gulag. I'm never calling it anything but Twitter. Uh, live not by series at live not by series. Uh, and then you can email us directly, the team at live not by lies project at gmail.com. And then Rod and Isaiah, both of you, starting with Rod, tell us where, tell folks where they can follow you, Twitter, Substack, all that. Oh, stuff. yeah. I, I'm on Twitter, not X, Twitter, uh, at Rod Dreher, R O D D R E H E R. I also write a uh, subscription only Substack, roddreher.substack.com. And uh, I'm, I've just started writing regularly, almost daily, for the European Conservative. It's all in English. Um, and I, I can say uh, briefly here, one of the things that I love about working with Angel Studios is people like me, Christian conservatives, complain constantly that nobody tells our stories. The media won't tell it. Hollywood won't tell it. Well, now finally, Angel is giving Christians and others a chance to tell the story or have the stories that we know need to be told to get them told. And now it's up to us uh, to step up and support these projects. Love it. Yeah. yeah love Zay, it, where, That's where, great. Can people, where can Yeah. So, you? um, I'm a uh, Zay Smallman on Twitter. I'm a horrible tweeter, but I'm going to get better. I promise. And, um, yeah. And I think one of the best ways to follow along is just engaging with the project. I'm going to be, um, you know, yeah, again, really doing a lot to kind of keep people in the loop and, um, yeah, exciting view of our express interest page, which even during the course of this has gone up quite a bit. Um, we're at latest count well over 550,000 of expressed interest, which is just amazing. And we really want to keep the momentum going. And, um, you know, I wanted to say as well, before we, we should have saved a little more time for Q and a, but this is just exciting stuff and, and we'll be doing more of these soon. But, um, in terms of, you know, even just how we do this, we're ready to go. I mean, I've got a little, of, you could play the train leaving the station because that's a funny uh, clip. It's a great, well, it's not a funny clip. It's a great clip of Rod on a train. Um, but that's us. We are ready to go. We are already talking to department heads. We know how to make this stuff. We do it all the time. We are ready and we're excited to start laying it out. We're actually hoping to meet up in Nashville um, in the next couple of weeks and have a big creative summit. Um, I'm already working on kind of bigger creative treatments. We've obviously got the book to lean on and that provides a lot of great starting point for us. And, and that's another thing I wanted to say is, you know, as we're going through this process, go get the book, go get the book and read it. Um, it is going to be worth your time for one. And also it's, it's interesting because it's going to be a different experience than watching this. It's not like, you know, oh, you're going to read it and then there's going to be nothing in the series. We're going to start with the book and we're going to use a lot of great stuff in it, but ultimately it's fundamentally will be different. And so the book is just an amazing way to learn about what we're digging into, engage with Rod's great research that he's already done and kind of get ready for this. Um, and by the way, thank you all for the, for the recent, uh, expressed interest. Um, but yeah, the book is a great place to start and it will really equip you to kind of follow along with the story. So I really encourage people go get a copy of the book right now. You won't regret it. And, it, and it's just a great way to kind of prime yourselves for, for engaging with this project on a longer term basis. All, all of my best friends are named anonymous. So thank you for uh, all of you contributing to this tonight. So, all right. So we've, we've been teasing it for almost an hour. Let's get to it. Let's get into a few questions. We'll be back next week. We'll get into more. We'll share more. Again, you can reach out to us again. Shoot us an email, live not by lies project at gmail.com. If you liked what you saw, if you have further questions, you know, apart from these live streams, but Micah, if you want to cue us up uh, a question or two, let's get into it. Okay, uh, great. Well, we mentioned it, but let's unpack it just for a second further. Abby says, how many episodes are you planning on releasing? Isaiah, you Yeah, can't... so we aren't making a, we're not going to make like a, an official formal commitment to this. I think six is kind of a perfect number. Um, it could fluctuate a little bit depending on kind of how things unfold in production, but um, we're not talking 20. 
but we're talking more than two or three. Let's just put it that way. So um, I think uh, the idea would be in that range. Yeah, and if we could be so bold, we like to dream big. As Isaiah alluded to a second ago, this is all Isaiah and I do. This is our job is making films and making TV series and making doc series. Like, So this is all, all we do all day. We love it. There's nothing I'd rather do in this world. Uh, but it is the kind of business where you set out with a plan and we would love to do six episodes of this. Again, it's it's entirely dependent on on the fans and, and what they want to see and are willing to uh, express interest in. But that's what we'd love to do because this is a big canvas to paint on. We also want to dream big and see their stories. Sadly, totalitarianism has impacted the entire globe at different times and places. So there are other stories to tell beyond maybe this initial, let's call it season. But for now, we're, we're aiming at this. We need you and your friends and your family to express interest. Uh, as he said, as, as Isaiah said, if you haven't yet, get the book, read the book, share it with friends. Of those 200,000 copies, I claim about 22 or 23 of those, Rod, that I've personally purchased for friends. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, the this book focuses on the Soviet Union and Soviet-occupied Europe. But if this uh, series is a success, we want to talk to people who endured communism in Asia, China, Vietnam, and in Cuba and in Venezuela. I mean, as you say, the the the... The evil is the same the world over. Yeah, absolutely. All absolutely. right, let's get another question chambered. All right, Isabel says, right. where, where can, can I get, get the, book? the book? I want to read it. Uh, ah, Jeff Bezos ah, well. will get, bring you a copy to your house, I believe, right? <laughs> yeah, Rod, where's the best place to get the book? <laughs> no, I, I, I would where do say you make the most money, me. Rod, from somebody buying it? It, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, an independent bookstore is what I want you to, to go to. An mm. eighth-day book, a great Christian bookstore in Wichita. You can order online for them. But if you want, you can get it from barnesandnoble.com. Uh, you can get it from amazon.com. Uh, you can get it in audio, uh, paperback, hardback, or on Kindle. Or you can meet Rod for breakfast at another Broken Egg Cafe in uh, yeah. Baton Rouge and you hand you a copy. <laughs> no, baby, you'd have to come to Budapest to get a copy now. Uh, it's true. So, yes, yeah, know, yeah. If, no. No kidding, no kidding. One of the reasons I'm here now living in the former communist world is because of the people I met when I was working on this, because of the opportunities here. One of my jobs here and working for the Danube Institute, a think tank here in Budapest, is to help build a network of uh, Christian leaders, pastors, intellectuals, thinkers, and uh, others to, um, to help prepare for any for trouble to come. Great. Awesome. awesome. All right. We got a couple more. Uh, next question. Second to last. All right. Will says, will Mr. Dreher help write the script? Now, I'll say something quick and then Isaiah, you can unpack it further. You know, this this genre of project is literally called unscripted, right? Documentary unscripted. But it's a great question because, of course, there is so much thought, research, outlining, and again, Isaiah, you can talk a little bit about it and Rod Chiman as well, but but the, it isn't the traditional sit down, you know, writing out what everyone's going to say, but there are scripts, there's narration possibly, there's a lot of different things, but Isaiah, you, you can speak to that. Yeah, I would say the simple answer is we're a team and we're excited to kind of do whatever it takes to bring all these stories to life in the most effective way possible. And so, yeah, we're all going to be contributing in various ways. I think in a lot of ways, Rod has written the script. I mean, he did the research for the book. That's what the series is going to be based on. And, but yeah, to RJ's point, most of this is, is, um, kind of, you know, in the process of being captured rather than written. And so, um, beyond that, yeah, we'll see how it goes and we'll all be kind of contributing, um, wherever we can. And I'm sure, Rod's going to be doing all of the heavy lifting on my behalf. <laughs> well, no, I, I look forward to doing this because, uh, you know, I've never done film writing and writing for for film and video is very different than writing books. So uh, I'll uh, I'll be learning from you guys as we go. Rod, you've never you've never written like a, 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 a spec episode of Game of Thrones or something. There's not some uh, great <laughs> script that you've been dying to write some some play. No. I Dude, I, I used to be a film critic, professional film critic, and I know how oh, hard right, this stuff is. Yeah, I know of how course, hard this yes. stuff is. And, uh, 
I, I don't know that I have the talent for, but I guess we'll find out. I guess I look forward to learning. We're a team, after- baby. Yeah. All right. So we're going to take one more question from fans. And then I kind of want to close things out with a final question for Rod after that. But uh, let's get the last uh, fan question up. All right. Uh, what do you think will be the biggest challenge in making this series? Uh, I have a quick thought, but I'll, I'll wait. And you guys go first. Isaiah, let's start with you. And then Rod, any, any thoughts on the challenges ahead here? Because my question is going to tie into a little bit of this. Yeah. I would say the biggest challenge for me that there are tons of logistical challenges. There's tons of, you know, right now, the biggest challenge is we got to get funded. We got to get enough people behind this right now to say that we want to see this so that we can do it. Um, and so that we can, you know, gain, um, enough momentum to make that happen. And again, all of you who are here right now are, are part of that process. So thank you. What I would say though, the biggest challenge to me is I want to, how do I put this? I mean, I want to make art, you know, I, I, and I think that's always hard. It's always really hard to go into a situation and make art and not just sort of something, you know, that's a really crude way to put it, but like, we're all professionals. We can go and kind of just point the camera at some cool stuff. And I promise it's going to be compelling, but I want to, I want to transcend that. I want to find a way to capture really deep meaning and really deep sort of, um, connection with these people and with the moment that we're in and i want to do it in a way that is again very unifying and very inspiring and not alarmist and you know all these things that that's to me going to be the hardest part as a filmmaker is finding the nuance in all of these moments and finding which stories to tell and exactly how to weave them together in a way that's not just um and and again rod did a great job with his book but this is a different medium and we're going to have to kind of resolve that problem how do we organize it and how do we tell the stories in a way that's totally compelling but also easy to follow and um yeah really uh sort of sensible and 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 yet at the same time transcends kind of becomes more than the sum of its parts if it's well that to me as a filmmaker is always the biggest challenge and it's one that i'm really really excited about but it definitely is a little intimidating so rod Rod, Rod, can i Sorry, Rod, let me let me yeah. throw in my question and you answer it all together, whatever you're about to say. But my question to end it was going to be kind of a little bit about this. But specifically, you know, we're, we're three men of faith here. This is a story primarily of people of faith uh, who experience great challenges in their life. But even in the telling of stories and, and recounting and covering stuff like this, any of the spiritual warfare, anything you could speak to maybe in that regard of just uh, it, any of your thoughts as you wrote the book, as we're entering now into uh, hopefully telling this in, in a documentary series format, uh, again, please answer however you were going to. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I wanted to just get any of your kind of final closing thoughts, uh, meditation even on uh, the spiritual warfare aspect of even trying to tell a story like this. Yeah, I mean, it's it's extremely dark. Um, the stuff that's in the book right now and that we'll no doubt go into in the series takes you to some of the darkest parts of human experience. In the Romanian gulag, for example, uh, that was the worst gulag of any of the, in the communist countries. They forced people, um, uh, priests, uh, to do a, a mock uh, mass or, or a liturgy using feces for the host. I mean, just satanic stuff. And we're gonna have to tell those stories but it's ultimately going to be a story of hope. And I think that's going to be the real challenge because it's easy to talk about the extreme darkness, but the stories of triumph of people who endured that and did not lose their faith, but they lived to see the end of communism, something they didn't think was going to happen. That was one of the most amazing things to me is that every single person I talked to thought they would never live to see the end of communism. They resisted because it was the right thing to do. And um, I I think one challenge that is going to be, it's kind of a technical challenge, but we can't go to Russia now because of the war. I've already talked to some Russians about it. They said it's just too risky to go to Russia. So I'm already thinking about ways we can get the Russians I need to talk to out of Russia to come meet us in a a neutral third place to to talk about their own experiences. And we're going to have to be very careful when we talk to them because their lives could be in danger depending on what they say to us uh, on camera and um so this we're dealing with the real life live not by lies in a way that i didn't expect we would be when i wrote this uh when i wrote the book 
man. Well, that's a great point, I, Rod. Yeah. Let me just jump in on that super fast. I know you want to, I know we want to wrap up, but I think that's a fascinating component of this rod that is really important is like th this isn't again this isn't dead history this is right now and even the yeah. way that we make the series is being affected by the reality that we're working in and i think um that's all the more compelling reason why this has to be made why we need to make it well why we need to do a really great job so that for for generations to come that we can document these stories um in a way that is uh, valuable to people who are going to be dealing with all these problems indefinitely. You know, it's not going to go away, but anyway. Guys, I can't believe it's already been a little over an hour. This has been a blast. Rod, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for uh, waking up or, or staying up uh, to, <laughs> to be with us today. Uh, guys, we're, we're so grateful for Angel. We're thankful for this audience. Uh, we're grateful for the stories in this book, the stories we want to tell, uh, all the adventures that we want to go on. And we need your help. Angel.com slash live. Uh, thank you to everyone who's joined us here. This has been a blast. We look forward to interacting with you yeah. on, on social media and yeah. elsewhere. Um, but we're going to be back next week. Same time, same place. Um, and we'll get into other aspects of this project. But please tell your friends. Send a link. Uh, I believe this will be up to watch and share afterwards uh, as well. But yeah, as Rod said, this stuff doesn't get made. We, there's no world in which, sadly, we can go to Netflix or Hulu or someone and pitch something like this. Right. Even though it's, and, a, you know, even our, though it's I, a huge following. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, just last night at dinner with my Hungarian friends, they were saying that they can't understand why it is that it's been 30 years since the Cold War ended. And nobody in the West talks about communism. It went down the memory hole. That's not an accident that it went down the memory hole. Mm. But what we, uh, the, the three of us, our team and our supporters out there who will, will be uh, registering their support for us and helping us make this thing, we're going to tell those stories. If Hollywood doesn't want to tell it, if the media doesn't want to tell it, we cannot let these people go into go to their graves with their stories untold it's just not right and i'm just so grateful to angel and to all of you who are backing the movie so far and to you guys we're going to get this told and we're going to make these people uh the, these these saints who survived the worst of the 20th century we're going to make them proud awesome isaiah final word take us out i uh, yeah i i mean gosh yeah rod said it all i think what an amazing opportunity to do something that a number of years ago would have been basically impossible. I mean, again, that's, that's partly because of angel and, you know, I'm just so excited that we can now use the internet, which I'm have mixed feelings about. Of course, I think a lot of people probably here do, and we'll even go into that some in the, in the series, but let's use these tools we have and let's, let's, uh, let's spread the word, you know, right now let's spread the word because, um, there are a lot of people around the world who are dealing with this. There's a lot of people who can be inspired. And again, that's a big, big takeaway that I want people to have. This is not doom and gloom. We will, we need to deal with the reality. We need to tell the stories. We need to get into the history. But as Rod said, I think finding the hope in all of this is an incredibly important priority for all of us. And it, it is the version of the story that does not get told, even when it seldomly does somehow kind of get covered a little bit. That is the part that I think is often missing in a lot of those other um, tellings. And I think that's an opportunity that we really have that's that's very exciting and I'm excited to, uh, to get a chance to do that. I mean, I'm just so grateful to be doing this. I just wanna say that. Thank you all. Thank you, RJ. Thank you, Rod, for trusting me to come on the team. And I'm just really, really excited. So it's great stuff. Yeah, and uh, the last thing I'll say, and not to toot our own horns, but prepare to be to have your horn tooted, uh, you know, this, our, our torch video was the highest rated in, in the history of, of angel. At least that's what we were told. Uh, and it's, it's the, it's the story. It's the stories Rod has captured. It's the work we've put into this. It's the work we're committed to building upon with your help, uh, the audience. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to coming back. It, next. It, it's week. not, it Take wasn't my Brad Pitt like face. It wasn't my Brad Pitt like face. <laughs> hold one last Sultz and Eichen. Hold up Sultz and Eichen one more time. It's it's uh <laughs> Yeah, tell uh, tell Uncle Alex good night. Yeah. Yeah. There we the go. Best, All right, the best the best behind the scenes is gonna be when we all go get Sultz and Eichen tattoos on our uh, on our backs. It's gonna be great. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. On that note, thank you. Thank you for joining us. God bless. Yes, we'll talk signing off. Week, thank you all. Great stuff. Already people are beginning to forget about communism. They're beginning to forget about the victims of communism, which now number we know about 100 million. I mean, there was no freedom. There was no freedom of speech, no freedom of religion, no freedom of thought. People couldn't write a poem or a play or, or a story or conduct a scientific experiment without some censor first approving it. All of that story has to be told. Back in 2014, I got a phone call from a physician at the Mayo Clinic who reached out and said, I need to tell a journalist what just happened. He told me that his elderly mother, who lives with him and his wife, had been raised in Czechoslovakia. When communism came to power there after the Second World War, the government told her to quit going to church. She said, I'm not going to quit going to church. They threw her in prison for four years and tortured her as a so-called Vatican spy. She immigrated to America, started her life here. Now she was telling her son, son, the things I see happening in America today remind me of what was happening in my own country when communism came. Well, what was the old lady seeing? She's seeing the effects of cancel culture. She was seeing people facing the loss of job and the loss of their livelihood for getting on the wrong side of the politically correct. People being afraid to speak their minds for fear of losing their job or being hounded out of polite society. So over the next few years, if I would meet someone who had grown up under Soviet communism but came to America, I would put the question to them. Are the things you're seeing happen in our country today in any way reminiscent of what you left behind? Every single one of them said yes. In a new book, my next guest suggests that we may be heading down a dangerous path toward totalitarianism. Live Not By Lies. A remarkable new book entitled Live Not By Lies. 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 Inspired not least by the great Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I got the title for the book from an essay by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. The Soviets exiled him from the country. They kicked him out in 1974. Just before he was kicked out, he sent a short essay to all of his followers. The name of the essay was Live Not By Lies, because the whole communist system was built on lies, lies about human nature, lies about the way the world is, and it can only be sustained when people are afraid to live in truth. Everybody in the Soviet system lied about everything to everyone all the time. And so the whole system was set up and maintained because everyone lied. There are so many people among the intelli intelligentsia especially who are absolutely immune to facts. It's as, as, if, they, it's as if they took their uh, anti-fact shots uh, every, every, every year and uh, the facts will just not affect it. They shut down schools over COVID and then stole a bunch of pandemic relief for themselves. I know that they're lying to me. I know that they're lying to, to, to the nation. We have to say that men can have babies, that men can be women and women can be men. Totalitarian governments try to take away cultural memory, which is to say the memory of a people that tells them who they are. We've seen this happen in our own country with statues taken down, where history suddenly becomes extremely contentious. One of the things that disturbs me tremendously is about this enthusiasm for socialism at a time when people are literally starving in Venezuela, an oil-rich country. Yesterday I asked ChatGPT, are there any similarities between today's woke revolution and Chairman Mao's cultural revolution of the 1960s? And it wrote back, how long do you have? People don't take it seriously because they think of totalitarianism and what comes to mind is George Orwell. What comes to mind is Stalin, secret police, gulags, firing squads, things like that. That's not what we're dealing with yet, at least. In China, they have what's called a social credit system under which the Chinese government controls every Chinese citizen. It has the computer power to track everybody's movements all throughout the day. If you meet with people the government considers to be antisocial, that is to say Christians or dissidents, that is noted by the system and you get automatically a lower social credit rating. Eventually, if you get a low enough social credit rating, you can't buy or sell or participate in the economy. Now that should send chills down the spine of every Christian who knows his or her Bible. Alexander Solzhenitsyn said that the line between good and evil 
It's not passed between social classes or between you know, races or anything else. The line between good and evil passes right down the middle of every human heart. I remember standing on a street corner in Moscow talking to a white-haired elderly Russian Baptist pastor, a man whose father and the fathers of all the men in his community when they were little were taken away by Stalin and sent to Siberia. He said, go back to America and tell the church, if you're not prepared to suffer for your faith, then your faith is worthless. Well, what did he mean by that? Through every generation of Christianity, even today in countries like Egypt, in the Muslim world, and in China, Christians are suffering for their faith. It is vital that we get this eyewitness testimony on camera so people in our country will not forget history, that they'll know history and they'll learn from history so that we can build the resistance now while we still have the freedom to do so. Eventually, this whole system of lies will fall apart but it will take longer for it to fall apart if people are afraid to stand up for the truth, if people are afraid to have the courage to resist, to say, you do to me whatever you can, I will not live by lies.